So we need a radius of three. Our max radius is three. So I'm gonna draw three circles here. Try to make them have, uh, actually be circular and relatively sized correctly. Those are pretty bad, but I'll work with them. So I got my 45s. Now I'll do my 60 degrees and 30 degrees. So I'll plot the first two points, and I'll switch over to blue for these. So three zero radius three angle zero is right out there. And now pi over six, 2.74. So pi over six, my first angle, 2.74. So that's between two and three. And it's about three fourths of the way between two and three. And the last, or the third point, Pi over four, 2.42. So that's close to two and a half. So it's right about there. So I want you to graph the rest of the points off this chart right here. So pi over three and two, and then keep going around. If things are written in order, you really only need to pay attention to the radii as you slowly move to the next angle. So as long as things are written in order, you just move to the next angle and then use the next radius. Now once you have all your points plotted, go ahead and use the symmetry that we got, which should be x-axis, and flip your graph over the x-axis. So draw the corresponding points and then connect them. It's a good time for questions if you're not sure. Going the right way, but yeah, I think you went out three. Oh, I think the first one from here. So confused. Got it. So this one had negative radi radii, which makes it a little bit tricky because you have to think of your angle and then graph on the other direction or the opposite direction.
So any questions on the original points? They should look a lot like these. So I'm, I'm going to connect them together before I copy the, or use the mirror image, because otherwise I might not connect them in the right order. So I don't want to have too many points before I play connect the dots. Oh, that's fine. You're probably, as long as you pay attention to which ones you drew when, you'll probably can connect them without a problem. So it should be this kind of, a lot of these are going to have this kind of increasing or decreasing spiral shape to them. It'll be some type of not quite circular, not quite spiral, but in the middle. All right, now I'm going to go mirror image. We use the origin twice. We can't really right on top of a point, but we got to use the origin twice. So your graph should look something like this. It looks kind of like a cardioid or a heart with an extra loop on the inside. So you're going to get that extra inner loop whenever, if we look at the original equation that we graphed, there's two pieces to pay attention to or two coefficients when your variable term has a larger coefficient than your constant term then your uh, graph will have an inner loop. So basically when the trig portion of your function varies more than the constant would be. So if my constant, for example, was 10, this would not have an inner loop. But because my constant was 1 and cosine goes between negative 1 and positive 1, that means the part that's going to vary is going to uh, make this first part negative for some theta values. You don't need to remember that as long as you can find the symmetry, plot your points, and graph with symmetry. All right, so we did that graph. I think we do two more graphs now. We're going to do one that has all three symmetries. Of course. So we've actually looked at graphs that have all three symmetries. What type of a graph? What type of a uh, graph has all three? Circle around the origin. Unit yep, unit circle or any circle around the origin is going to have all symmetries. There are some other examples, but that'll be the main example that has all the symmetries. So this next example. will be r equals 2 cos 2 theta. So something a little strange is happening. Instead of just theta as the input for cosine, this one is going to input 2 theta. So that's going to be the main difference on this. So we're, of course, going to go for symmetry first. So we'll begin with the x-axis, where we replace theta with minus theta. You have to be careful if I just write out, replace theta by negative theta, what does it look like I'm actually doing? Two minus so we don't want to subtract, we want to multiply by two. So we got two cos negative two theta. Now cosine is an even function, which means that negative two theta is going to give me the same thing as regular two theta. So I can basically erase that negative sign right there. So that's because cosine is even. So we get passing our x-axis symmetry. Is cosine always going to be 
symmetric across the x-axis as long as the outcome would like a negative infinite? Usually, the uh, exception would be, so if it's cosine of a number of a constant times theta, it will have x-axis symmetry. But for example, if uh, even something that looks a little bit simpler, if I did like pi minus theta or something like that, then if I swap theta to negative theta to positive theta, I would get cos pi plus theta, which I need the sum formula. Right. So generally, yes, unless you see something like this. So as long as cosine is just eating theta or a multiple of theta, it will have x-axis symmetry. All right, so we're going to look for y next. So here we're placing theta with pi minus theta. So we have to be careful when we plug in. We have to multiply the whole thing pi minus theta by 2. So we got 2 pi minus 2 theta. And now we're going to use the difference formula for cosine. So cosine difference formula goes cos cos plus sine sine. What is cosine 2 pi? So what is cosine 2 pi? So 2 pi is the same place in the unit circle that 0 is. So what is cosine of 2 pi? So that's going to be 1. So we got 1 times cos 2 theta. Plus, what is sine of 2 pi? 0. Same point in the unit circle, we're just taking the y value. So we got 0 times I don't care. It's going to be 0. So this simplifies down to 2 cos 2 theta. That is exactly what we started with somewhere up here. It's written down. 2 cos 2 theta is what we started with. So we passed our y-axis test also. So if we think of the rule of 2, now this assumes we didn't make any mistakes. So if you can't have 2, what does that mean about origin? We would have to pass. So if we did origin test, we would find out we passed that as well. All right, so we have all three symmetries. That means not only can I reflect across the, x, uh, the y axis, I could reflect across the x axis. I can also rotate halfway. So that's a whole lot of arrows right there. So everybody likes the first quadrant. Let's think about if we graphed out the first quadrant, I could then use y axis symmetry to graph the second quadrant. So I'll flip over with y axis symmetry. And then I can use x axis symmetry to take quadrant 1 and 2, flip it over to get 3 and 4. So then I use x-axis symmetry, and I get everything all the way around the circle. So all I need to do is graph quadrant 1, and then I'll use symmetries. So we're going to the clueless method. Where we're only going to graph theta in quadrant 1. So that's 0 to pi over 2. So first thing we have to do, cosine doesn't eat theta, cosine eats 2 theta. So we're going to double our theta value. Then we're going to feed it into cosine and use the approximate values. And then we multiply by 2 at the very end. So it's 2 cos 2 theta. All right, so let's double all the theta values. So 2 times 0 is 0. 2 times pi over 6 is pi over 3. 2 times pi over 4 is pi over 2. 2 times pi over 3, 2 pi over 3. 
and 2 times pi over 2 is pi. Be a little careful when you apply the cosine function, because these we're basically skipping angles. So we go now from 0, we're skipping pi over 6, going to pi over 3. And then we're skipping, oh no, then we go right to pi over 2. So be a little careful about the cosine values you fill in, because they're not the regular order. So find all those cosine values. So in this case, we had none of the square roots. These were all relatively nice cosine values. And just double all of these. So we have five points to plot. Our biggest radius is 2 and negative 2. So I only need two concentric circles to do this. So I think you probably plotted enough points. I'll let you plot all five and then connect them together with the curve. And then you have to use two different symmetries to get the full graph. And make sure you don't read the angles in the second column because you're using the angles from the first column and the radius from the last column. So don't read the second column angle. Those are not ones on the graph. should have this weird C type shape down there. So now I want you to use, we said it doesn't matter which symmetry you use first, let's just do Y axis first. So use Y axis symmetry and then apply X axis.
So questions about the graph. So yes is, is named after a flower, not the right flower. It's, this is called rose curves. Have you seen a rose? It does look like a rose. Looks like most other flowers that are not roses, but it does not look like a rose. But it's called rose curves for some reason. Yeah. I'm trying to think of other flowers that don't look like that, and there's not too many. <laughs> Tulips, lilies, I think even dandelions. It doesn't matter. Lots of flowers look like this. All right. <clears throat> so we'll do one more example. And this one is going to be different than all the others. So we, we looked at one that was a little different before that had an uh, angle of 2 theta that did some strange things. This next example will have an r squared in it. Okay, so r squared equals this. If we solve for r, r is plus or minus square root 4 sine 2 theta, which is plus or minus 2 square root sine 2 theta. So that means r is either, either going to be positive or negative. So that basically you're going to get two r values for each angle. So you're going to plot two points at the same time. So it's going to be a little bit tricky. Hopefully it doesn't mess up our values too much. Well, let's go ahead and find symmetry. I strongly recommend use the original to find symmetry. Don't use that square root version. So we're going to find symmetry off the original there. I'm going to use origin first. We don't normally do this. One of the origin tests is replace r with negative r. So that's one of the two origin tests. So why is this going to be really easy? I just see r drop in negative r. So how do I simplify negative r squared? Just regular r squared. So that squaring makes it positive. So it doesn't matter if r was negative or positive. You're going to square it. And it's going to force it to be positive. So we just passed the origin test right there. I personally find the x-axis test the next easiest one to perform. So I recommend go x-axis uh, next. You could go y-axis. It just takes a little longer. So with our x-axis, we know sine is odd. So that negative is basically going to pull through the sine function. And we're going to get something different. That one negative sign messes everything up. So we're going to fail this symmetry test so we do not get x-axis. So what does that mean about y-axis? You got to automatically fail because you can't have two of them. So it's automatically failed. All right, so we just have origin. So we actually get some choices with, with origin. Let's think about just the first quadrant. If we graph the first quadrant, origin symmetry gives us the third quadrant. It's a little strange, but you rotate halfway, and you get the third quadrant. So we're going to need to graph a little more than quadrant one. So we have a choice. I could do quadrant one and two, and then that rotates to three and four. So I could do one and two. That's an option. The other option is I could do 1 and 4, and that will rotate to 2 and 3. So it doesn't matter which of the two quadrants that you go for. I'll just go for uh, 1 and 2. 
arbitrarily. It's the one that I thought of first. So we'll graph one and two values. So we got theta, zero, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two, two pi over three, three pi over four, five pi over six, and pi. The first thing we're going to do is double our angle, just like last time. And then apply the sine function. And then our last step, we'll do plus minus square root, because that's how we get the radius. So fill in the clueless chart. I have the decimal approximations written down for the square root of square root of 3 over 2. So if there are any questions about the first five values, all I did with that square root, square root 3 over 2, is just wrote the decimal approximation down. All right, when we get down to uh, square roots of negatives, what do we get if we take a square root of a negative value? So we get imaginary or complex numbers. So when we graph them, we don't graph imaginary radii. So all the negatives down here, these are all imaginary values, so they're not going to show up on our graph. Even the two, five, zero, the last oh, actually, yeah, that last one will show up. Uh, yes. All right, so let's graph these. We'll graph all the positive radii first, connect them together, and then we'll re-graph with the negative radii. So we'll graph all the positives first, then all the negatives. I'm going to draw my graph to the right. It'll be easier to see. Oh, they won't let me move to the right. All 
I only need 2 and minus 2 as my, actually even only 1.9. Oh, wait, I really messed up here. Oh, there should be a 2 in front of this square root. That's pretty important. I completely forgot about that 2, which came from somewhere up here. I did the original work. Here we go. That's the form I'm using at the bottom. So I totally forgot to multiply by 2. Good news is I'm copying off my notes, so those values are still correct. So <clears throat> there should be a 2 in front of each of these. However, my approximate values already included that times 2. So that's how I got, well, except for that guy should be a 2. There we go. All right, now my value should be correct. So our biggest radius is 2. So I only need two concentric circles. So for angle 0, we have 0. For angle pi over 6, we have 1.9 way out there. And then 2, and then 1.9. And then we hit 0 a second time. So there's the five points. And connecting them as smoothly as possible is going to look like this. So that is positive, all the positive radii. So now I'm going to graph again with all the negative values right here. So starting at 0 and then negative 1.9. So at pi over 6, I'm going negative 1.9. At pi over 4, we're going negative 2. At pi over 3, negative 1.9. And then back to the origin again. So we have this shape right here. Now, if anything was to be called rose petals or rose flower shaped, it would be this one, but it's not. This one has some weird, I call it propeller shaped. I would call it rose shaped, but that name's already taken. All right, symmetry. We said uh, origin. Does the graph already have origin, or do I have some more work to do? Yeah. If I rotate the graph halfway around the origin, or pi around the origin, does anything change? No. Nope. So our two propeller blades will switch places, but they will look exactly the same. So this graph already has that symmetry. So symmetry is already there. And that's all we need to do for this graph. So we're about to jump into the next section, which is called complex numbers. So we are going to look at complex numbers. And you should be asking yourself, why are we looking at complex numbers in a trigonometry class? That's exactly what I was asking myself. Good. <laughs> why are we? Uh, we're going to consider them as polar 
complex numbers. So my complex analysis professor used to say, complex, everything you do in complex numbers, just like real numbers, you just replace x by z. So that's a good quote I'll put right here, replace x by z. All the algebra works out exactly the way it does for real numbers. You get all the cool properties like distributive property, uh, multiplication, addition, or commutative, associative, all the fun rules. So all the rules you learn still apply. So only thing you really need to pay attention to replace x by z. Um, the other important thing to know about complex numbers, you have this number i. One way to think of it is i is the square root of negative 1. So what we're going to start out with is looking at powers of i. So what is i squared? So it'll be, yeah, square root of negative 1 times square root of negative 1. So it'll be square root of negative 1 squared or just negative 1. So i squared is negative 1. And we'll keep going, increasing powers. All right, i cubed, the way I want you to think about it is i squared times i. So base times a base, you can add their powers. So 2 plus 1 is 3, which is why these are equal. So all the same exponent rules still work here. So we got negative 1 times i, which is negative i. So i cubed, negative i. And we'll keep going up in powers. i to the fourth, I could think of it as i squared, i squared. Or I could write it as i squared, squared. So I can write it either way. In the first case, i squared times i squared because 2 plus 2 is 4. How do we do exponents of exponents? What do I do with those two exponents? So I don't add them together. When it's exponents of exponents, you multiply them. And 2 plus 2 also happens to equal 4, which is why I can write it in the two different ways. Now just replace i squared by negative i. No, negative 1, jeez. i squared is negative 1. And of course we know negative 1 squared is positive 1. All right, i to the fourth is regular 1. So we'll look at i to the fifth power. So I could write this as i to the fourth times i. So that's pulled out i to the fourth, and I'm just left with i to the first power. Why did I pull out i to the fourth and not i cubed and i squared? What's good about i to the fourth? It's one. it's one. So it's one times i, which is just i. So basically, i to the fourth is one. So you can multiply by i to the fourth. You can divide by i to the fourth whenever you want. It's not going to change anything. So it's i to the fifth. Tell me about i to the sixth, seventh. So simplify i to the sixth and i to the seventh. I'll give you a hint, i to the fourth is one. So use that property. So i to the sixth, you should have negative one, and i to the seventh you should have negative i. So any questions about those? Hopefully you're noticing the cyclic pattern every four. You get the exact same pattern happening. So I could ask you about i to the 71st power. How can we deal with i to the 71st power? So basically, how many i to the fourths are hiding inside of there? So there's a bunch of i to the fourth, so fill in the blank there, and then tell me how many i's are left over. So divide 71 by 4, 
and you're really concerned about the remainder. So it comes down to the remainder. So we got 17 out of the four deciding in there, and we had three left over. It really only depended on how many we had left over. All right, so that's how we can do high powers of i. What about negative powers? There's a few ways to deal with negative powers. So this, of course, is neg uh, i to the negative 1. So I'm allowed to multiply by i to the fourth because that is the same as multiplying by 1 right there. So all I did was I multiplied by 1. Special version of 1. What can I do with those exponents? Bases are the same, so I add the exponents. So this is i cubed, which is negative i. So that's kind of strange. So 1 over i is actually the same as negative i. So if you reciprocate i, it becomes negative. That's really strange. So tell me what i to the negative 2 power is. So i <clears throat> is considered an imaginary number. Complex numbers are a real number plus an imaginary number. So we'll define it. We're going to use this capital C So complex numbers look like a plus bi such that a and b are both real numbers. So there's the definition of the complex numbers. If we graph a complex number, we have two axes. We have a real axis and an imaginary real axis. So our horizontal axis is the real axis. The vertical axis is the imaginary axis. So if we have a plus bi, that means go over a, go up b. And that point right there is called a plus bi. What do you use imaginary numbers for? I don't know much about the real world, so okay. I know electrical engineering uses imaginary numbers. How? You should go ask somebody who's an electrical engineer. I don't know. Wait. Don't I know everything about all applications of mathematics? No. I know a lot about pure math. Pure mathematics, which is not the application of it, just a theory. So I know a lot about theory. Before, so the notation we used before for points, we used AB. So notationally, this is just plotted just like the point AB. So you can think of the real coordinate as the x value or the horizontal, and the imaginary as the vertical. And of course, we're going to look at polar coordinates. So we're going to look at the radius r and the angle theta. This is going to work just like points, 
just like polar points and rectangular points. So how do we get R from A plus B I? So how does R relate to A and B? I'll redraw my triangle. A is the horizontal, B is the vertical. How do I get R from A and B? You know the answer. You know the answer the first day of class. Square root. I just don't want to be wrong. I'm always right. It would be so bad if I was wrong once. All right, so there's R. We have a special name for this. This is called the modulus right here. So when you're dealing with complex numbers, it's called the modulus. Now, to warn you, this is written as A plus BI with vertical bars on the outside, which is exactly how we write absolute value. So it's going to be written just like absolute value. Is it absolute? Yes but not in the way that a lot of students think. So we'll detour for a minute and talk about absolute value of real numbers and how it's exactly the same as this. So real numbers are just like complex numbers, except they don't have a complex part. So they got, oh, it should be an I, not zero B. All right, so real numbers are just like complex numbers. They don't have the imaginary part. So they would be written all like this. So whatever number you're thinking of, if your favorite number is seven, you just think seven plus no I's. That's seven. All right, follow the same strategy we just looked at. I have it in the bottom left corner. It's square root. And you want to be careful. It's A squared plus zero squared. So I'm just taking, you take the coefficient of i. You don't take i itself. So you're taking the number in front of i, which is 0. So we get square root a squared, also known as absolute value of a. Not quite a itself, because if a is negative, if I square it first and then go square root, I will get the absolute value. So it is absolute value. However, this is the common mistake I see. which is make each coefficient positive. That's not the same thing. So don't just make the coefficients positive. It's an operation. You square the coefficients and then add them together, take a square root. So don't just make individually the terms positive. That is not the uh, absolute value or the uh, modulus.